Section 5 of Across Asia on a Bicycle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Across Asia on a Bicycle by Thomas Allen. Part 3. Through Persia to Samarkand. It is all bosh was the all but universal opinion of Bayezid in regard to our alleged ascent of Ararat. None but the Persian consul and the Mutasarif himself deigned to profess a belief in it, and the gift of several letters of Persian officials, and a sumptuous dinner on the eve of our departure went far toward proving their sincerity. On the morning of July 8th, in company with a bodyguard of Zaptis, which the Mutasari forced upon us, we wheeled down from the ruined embattlements of Bayezid. The assembled rabble raised a lusty cheer at parting. An hour later, we had surmounted the Kazli Ghul, and the land of Iran was before us. At our feet lay the Turco-Persian battle plains of Caldrian, spreading like a desert expanse to the parched barren hills beyond, and dotted here and there with clumps of trees in the village oasis. And this, then, was the land where, as the poets say, the nightingale sings and the rose-tree blossoms and where a flower is crushed at every step. More truth, we thought, in the Scotch traveler's description, which divides Persia into two portions, one desert with salt, and the other desert without salt. In time we came to MacGregor's opinion, as expressed in his description of Khorasan. We should fancy, said he, a small green circle round every village, indicated on the map, and shade all the rest in brown. The mighty hosts, whose onward sweep from the Indus westward was checked only by the Grecian phalanx upon the field of Marathon, must have come from the scattered ruins around, which reminded us that Iran was, she is no more. Those myriad ranks of Yengis, Han, and Tamerlan brought death and desolation from Turan to Iran, which so often met to act and react upon one another, that both are now only landmarks in the sea of oblivion. Our honorary escort accompanied us several miles over the border to the Persian village of Kilisakand and there committed us to the hospitality of the district Khan, with whom we managed to converse in the Turkish language, which, strange to say, we found available in all the countries that lay in our transcontinental pathway as far as the Great Wall of China. Toward evening we rode in the garden of the harem of the Khan, and at the daybreak the next morning were again in the saddle. By a very early start we hoped to escape the burden of excessive hospitality. In other words, to get rid of an escort that was an expensive nuisance. At the next village we were confronted by what appeared to be a shouting, gesticulating maniac. On dismounting we learned that a harbinger had been sent by the Khan, and evening before to have a guard ready to join us as we passed through. In fact, two armed ferashes were galloping toward us, armed, as we afterward learned, with American rifles, and the usual kama, or huge dagger, swinging from a belt of cartridges. These fellows, like the Zaptis, were fond of ostentation, they frequently led us a roundabout way to show us off to their relatives or friends in a neighboring village. Nature at last came to our deliverance. As we stood on a prominent ridge 
taking a last look at Mount Ararat, now more than fifty miles away, a storm came upon us, showering hailstones as large as walnuts. The ferashes, with frantic steeds, dashed ahead to seek a place of shelter, and we saw them no more. Five days in Persia brought us to the shores of Lake Urumiya, the saltest body of water in the world. Early in the next morning we were wading the chilly waters of the Haji Chai, and a few hours later found us in the English consulate at Tabriz, where we were received by the Persian secretary. The English government, it seemed, had become embroiled in a local love affair just at a time when Colonel Stewart was off on diplomatic duty on the Russian Transcaspian border. An exceptionally bright Armenian beauty, a graduate of the American missionary schools at this place, had been abducted, it was claimed, by a young Kurdish cavalier and carried away to his mountain home. Her father, who happened to be a naturalized English subject, had applied for the assistance of his adopted country in obtaining her release. Negotiations were at once set on foot between London and Tehran, which finally led to a formal demand upon the Kurds by the Shah himself. Upon their repeated refusal, 7,000 Persian troops, it was said, were ordered to soak Bulak, under the command of the vice-consul, Mr. Patton. The matter at length assumed such an importance as to give rise in the House of Commons to the question, Who is Cathy Greenfield? This, in time, was answered by that lady herself, who declared under oath that she had become a Mohammedan and was in love with the man with whom she had eloped. More than this, it was learned that she had not a drop of English blood in her veins, her father being an Austrian and her mother a native Armenian. Whereupon the Persian troopers, with their much disgusted leader, bat an inglorious retreat leaving Cathy Greenfield mistress of the situation and of a Kurdish heart. In Tabriz there is one object sure to attract attention. This is the Ark, or ancient fortified castle of the Persian rulers. High on one of the sides, which a recent earthquake has rent from top to bottom, there is a little porch whence these Persian bluebeards or rather red beards, were wont to hurl unruly members of the harem. Under the shadow of these gloomy walls was enacted a tragedy of this century. Babism is by no means the only heresy that has sprung from the speculative genius of Persia, but it is the one that has most deeply moved the society of the present age and the one which still obtains, though in secret and without a leader. Its founder, Said Muhammad Ali, better known as Bab, or Gate, promulgated the doctrine of anarchy to the extent of sparing the road and spoiling the child, and still worse, perhaps, of refusing to the ladies no finery that might be at all becoming to their person. While not a communist, as he has sometimes been wrongly classed, he exhorted the wealthy to regard themselves as only trustees of the poor. With no thought at first of acquiring civil power, he and his rapidly increasing following were driven to revolt by the persecuting mullahs, and the sanguinary struggle of 1848 followed. Bab himself was captured and carried to this most fanatical city of Persia, the burial place of the sons of Ali. On this very spot a company was ordered to dispatch him with a volley 
but when the smoke cleared away, Bab was not to be seen. None of the bullets had gone to the mark, and the bird had flown, but not to the safest refuge. Had he finally escaped, the miracle thus performed would have made Babism invincible. But he was recaptured and dispatched, and his body thrown to the canine scavengers. Tabriz, fever dispelling, was a misnomer in our case. Our sojourn here was prolonged for more than a month by a slight attack of typhoid fever, which this time seized Sachtleben, and again the kind nursing of the missionary ladies hastened the recovery. Our mail, in the meantime, having been ordered to Tehran, we were granted the privilege of intercepting it. For this purpose we were permitted to overhaul the various piles of letters strewn over the dirty floor of the distributing office. Both the Turkish and Persian mail is carried in saddlebags, on the backs of rainless horses, driven at a rapid gallop before the mounted mail carrier or herdsman. Owing to the carelessness of the postal officials, legations and consulates employ special couriers. The proximity of Tabriz to the Russian border makes it politically as well as commercially one of the most important cities in Persia. For this reason, it is the place of residence of the Emir-e-Nizam, leader of the army, or prime minister, as well as the Wali-ad, or prince imperial. This prince is the Russian candidate, as opposed to the English candidate, for the prospective vacancy on the throne. Both of these dignitaries invited us to visit them, and showed much interest in our wonderful wind horses, of the speed of which exaggerated reports had circulated through the country. We were also favored with a special letter for the journey to the capital. On this stage we started August 15, stopping the first night at Turkman Chai, the little village where was signed the famous treaty of 1828, by virtue of which the Caspian Sea became a Russian lake. The next morning we were on the road soon after daybreak, and on approaching the next village overtook a curious cavalcade, just concluding a long night's journey. This consisted of a Persian palanquin with its long pole shafts saddled upon the back of a mule at each end, with servants on foot and a bodyguard of mounted soldiers. The occupant of this peculiar conveyance remained concealed throughout the stampede, which our sudden appearance occasioned among his hearse-bearing mules, for as such they will appear in the sequel. In our first article we mentioned an interview in London with Malcolm Hahn, the representative of the Shah at the court of St. James. Since then, it seemed, he had fallen into disfavor. During the late visit of the Shah to England, certain members of his retinue were so young, both in appearance and conduct, as to be a source of mortification to the Europeanized minister. This reached the ears of the Shah some time after his return home, and the summons was sent for the accused to repair to Tehran. Malcolm Hahn, however, was too well versed in Oriental craft to fall into such a trap, and announced his purpose to devote his future leisure to airing his knowledge of Persian politics in the London press. The Persian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Musht Ashar el Dawlet, then residing at Tabriz, who was accused of carrying on a seditious correspondence with Malcolm Han, was differently situated, unfortunately. It was during our sojourn in that city 
that his palatial household was raided by a party of soldiers, and he was carried to prison as a common felon. Being unable to pay the high price of pardon that was demanded, he was forced away a few days before our departure on that dreaded journey to the capital, which few, if any, ever complete. For on the way they are usually met by a messenger who proffers them a cup of coffee, a sword, and a rope, from which they are to choose the method of their doom. This, then, was the occupant of the mysterious palanquin, which now was opened as we drew up before the village caravansarai. Out stepped a man, tall and portly, with beard and hair of venerable gray. His keen eye, clear-cut features, and dignified bearing bespoke for him respect even in his downfall while his stooped shoulders and haggard countenance betrayed the weight of sorrow and sleepless nights with which he was going to his tomb. At Mayana, that town made infamous by its venomous insect, is located one of the storage stations of the Indo-European Telegraph Company. Its straight lines of iron poles which we followed very closely from Tabriz to Teheran, form only a link in that great wire and cable chain which connects Melbourne with London. We spent the following night in the German operator's room. The weakness of the Persian for mendacity is proverbial. One instance of this national weakness was attended with considerable inconvenience to us. By some mischance, we had run by the village where we intended to stop for the night, which was situated some distance off the road. Meeting a Persian lad, we inquired the distance. He was ready at once with a cheerful falsehood. One farshak, four miles, he replied, although he must have known at the time that the village was already behind us. On we paddled at an increased rate in order to precede, if possible, the approaching darkness, for although traditionally the land of a double dawn, Persia has only one twilight, and that closely merged into sunset and darkness. One, two far sacks were placed behind us, and still there was no sign of a human habitation. At length darkness fell we were obliged to dismount to feel our way. By the gradually rising ground and the rocks, we knew we were off the road. Dropping our wheels, we groped round on hands and knees to find, if possible, some trace of water. With a burning thirst, a chilling atmosphere, and swarms of mosquitoes biting through our clothing, we could not sleep. A slight drizzle began to descend. During our gloomy vigil, we were glad to hear the sounds of a caravan, toward which we groped our way, discerning at length a long line of camels marching to the music of their lantern-bearing leader. When our nickel-plated bars and white helmets flashed in the lantern light, there was a shriek, and the lantern fell to the ground. The rear guard rushed to the front with drawn weapons, but even they started back at the sound of our voices, as we attempted in broken Turkish to reassure them. Explanations were made, and the camels soon quieted. Thereupon we were surrounded with lanterns and firebrands, while the remainder of the caravan party was called to the front. Finally, we moved on walking side by side with the lantern-bearing leader, who ran ahead now and then to make sure of the road. The night was the blackest we had ever seen. Suddenly, one of the camels disappeared in a ditch and rolled over with a groan. Fortunately, no bones were broken and the load was replaced, but we were off the road, and the search was begun with lights to find the beaten path. 
footsore and hungry, with an almost intolerable thirst, we trudged along till morning to the ding-dong, ding-dong of the deep-toned camel bells. Finally, we reached a sluggish river, but did not dare to satisfy our thirst except by washing out our mouths and by taking occasional swallows with long intervals of rest in one of which we fell asleep from sheer exhaustion when we awoke the midday sun was shining and a party of persian travelers was bending over us from the highlands of azerbaijan where strange to say nearly all persian pestilences arise we dropped suddenly into the Kasvin plain, a portion of that triangular, dried-up basin of the Persian Mediterranean, now for the most part a sandy, saline desert. The argillaceous dust accumulated on the Kasvin plain by the weathering of the surrounding uplands resembles in appearance the yellow earth, of the Huang Ho district in China, but remains sterile for the lack of water. Even the little moisture that obtains beneath the surface is sapped by the canals, or underground canals, which bring to the fevered lips of the desert oasis the fresh, cool springs of the Elburs. These are dug with unerring instinct, and preserved with jealous care by means of shafts or slanting wells dug at regular intervals across the plain. Into these we would occasionally descend to relieve our reflection burned, or, as a person would say, snow-burned faces, while the thermometer above stood in 120 degrees in the shade. Over the level ninety miles stretch between Kasween and the capital, a so called carriage road has recently been constructed close to the base of the mountain. A sudden turn round the mountain spur, and before us was presented to view Mount Demavan and Teheran. Soon the paved streets, sidewalks, lamp posts, street railways, and even steam tramway of the half-modern capital were as much of a surprise to us as our wind horses were to the curious crowds that escorted us to the French hotel. From Persia, it was our plan to enter Russian Central Asia, and thence to proceed to China or Siberia. To enter the Transcaspian territory, the border province of the Russian possessions, the sanction of its governor, General Kurapakin, would be quite sufficient. But for the rest of the journey through Turkestan, the Russian minister in Tehran said we would have to await a general permission from St. Petersburg. Six weeks were spent with our English and American acquaintances, and still no answer was received. Winter was coming on, and something had to be done at once. If we were to be debarred from a northern route, we would have to attempt a passage into India, either through Afghanistan, which we were assured by all was quite impossible, or across the deserts of southern Persia and Baluchistan. For this latter, we had already obtained a possible route from the noted traveler, Colonel Stewart, whom we met on his way back to his consular post at Tabriz. But just at this juncture, the Russian minister advised another plan. In order to save time, he said, we might proceed to Meshed at once, and if our permission was not telegraphed to us at that point, we could then turn south to Baluchistan as a last resort. This our friends unanimously declared was a Moscovite trick to evade an absolute refusal. The Russians, they assured us, would never permit a foreign inspection of their doings on the Afghan border. And furthermore, 
we would never be able to cross the uninhabited deserts of Baluchistan. Against all protest, we waved farewell to the foreign and native throng which had assembled to see us off, and on October 5th wheeled out of the fortified square of the pilgrim road to Meshhead. Before us now lay 600 miles of barren hills, swampy caviars, briar-covered wastes, and salty deserts, with here and there some cannot-fed oasis. To the south lay the lifeless desert of Luth, the Persian Sahara, the humidity of which is the lowest yet recorded on the face of the globe, and compared with which the Gobi of China and the Kizil Kum of Central Asia are fertile regions. It is our extended and rather unique experience of the former of these two that prompts us to refrain from further description of desert travel here, where the hardships were in a measure ameliorated by frequent stations, and by the use of cucumbers and pomegranates, both of which we carried with us on the long desert stretches. Melons, too, the finest we have ever seen in any land, frequently obviated the necessity of drinking the strongly brackish water. Yet this experience was sufficient to impress us with the fact that the national poets, Hafiz and Sadi, like Thomas Moore, have sought in fancy what the land of Iran denied them, those spicy groves echoing with the nightingale song, those rosy bowers and purling brooks, on the whole exist, so far as our experience goes, only in the poet's dream. Leaving on the right the sand-swept ruins of Veramin, that capital of Persia before Tehran was ever thought of, we traversed the pass of Sir Daria, identified by some as the famous Caspian Gate, and early in the evening entered the village of Aradam. The usual crowd hemmed us in on all sides, yelling, Min, Min, ride, ride, which took the place of the Turkish refrain of Bin, Bin. As we rode toward the caravanserai, they shouted, Faster, faster, and when we began to distance them, they caught at the rear wheels and sent a shower of stones after us, denting our helmets and bruising our coatless backs. This was too much. We dismounted and exhibited the ability to defend ourselves, whereupon they tumbled over one another in their haste to get away. But they were at our wheels again before we reached the caravanserai. Here they surged through the narrow gangway, and knocked over the fruit stands of the bazaars. We were shown to a room, or windowless cell, in the honeycomb structure that surrounded an open quadrangular court, at the time filled with a caravan of pilgrims, carrying triangular white and black flags, with the Persian coat of arms, the same we have seen over many doorways in Persia, as warnings of the danger of trespassing upon the religious services held within. The cadaverous stench revealed the presence of half-dried human bones being carried by relatives and friends for interment in the sacred city of the silent. Thus dead bodies in loosely nailed boxes are always traveling from one end of Persia to the other, among the pilgrims were blue and green turbaned Saeeds, direct descendants of the Prophet, as well as white turbaned Mollahs. All were sitting about on the Saku, or raised platform, just finishing the evening meals. But presently one of the Mollahs ascended the mound in the middle of the stable yard and in the manner of the muezzin called to prayer. All kneeled and bowed their heads toward Mecca. Then the horses were saddled, the long narrow boxes attached upright to the pack mules, and the kajakas, 
or double boxes adjusted on the backs of the horses of the ladies. Into these the veiled creatures entered and drew the curtains, while the men leaped into the saddle at a signal, and with the tricornered flag at their head, the cavalcade moved out on its long night pilgrimage. We now learned that the village contained a Chapar Han, one of those places of rest which have recently been provided for the use of foreigners and others who travel Chapar, or by relays of post horses. These structures are usually distinguished by a single room built on the roof and projecting some distance over the eaves. To this we repaired at once. Its keeper evinced unusual pride in the cleanliness of his apartments, for we were asked to take off our shoes before entering. But while our boastful host was kicking up the mats to convince us of the truth of his assertions, he suddenly retired behind the scenes to rid himself of some of the pests. End of section 5section six of across asia on a bicycle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. across asia on a bicycle by thomas allen through persia to samarkand part two throughout our asiatic tour eggs were our chief means of subsistence but pilau or boiled rice flavored with grease we found more practically used in persia like yogurt in turkey this was prepared with chicken whenever it was possible to purchase a fowl and then we would usually make the discovery that a persian fowl was either wingless legless or otherwise defective after being prepared by a Persian fuzul, or foreigner's servant, who, it is said, shrinks from no baseness in order to eat. Though minus these particular appendages, it would invariably have a head, for the fanatical Shia frequently snatched a chicken out of our hands, to prevent us from wringing or chopping its head off. Even after our meal was served, we would keep a sharp lookout upon the unblushing pilferers around us, who had called to pay their respects and to fill the room with clouds of smoke from their chubuks and gurgling kalyans. For a fanatical Shia, will sometimes stick his dirty fingers into the dishes of an unbeliever, even though we may subsequently throw away the contaminated vessel. And this extreme fanaticism is to be found in a country noted for its extensive latitude of the profession of religious beliefs. A present from the village Han was announced, in stepped two men bearing a huge tray filled with melons, apricots, sugar, rock candy, nuts, pistachios, etc., all of which we must, of course, turn over to the Han keeper and his servants and pay double their value to the bearers as a present. This polite method of extortion was followed the next morning by one of a bolder and more peremptory nature. Notwithstanding the feast of the night before at our expense, and in addition to furnishing us with bedclothes, which we really ought to have been paid to sleep in, our oily host now insisted upon three or four prices for his lodgings. We refused to pay him more than a certain sum, and started to vacate the premises. Thereupon he and his grown son caught hold of our bicycles. Remonstrances proving of no avail, and being unable to force our passage through the narrow doorway with the bicycle in our hands, 
we dropped them and grappled with our antagonists. A noisy scuffle, and then a heavy fall ensued, but luckily we were both on the upper side. This unusual disturbance now brought out the inmates of the adjoining end room. In a moment there was a din of feminine screams and a flutter of garments, and then a crashing of our pith helmets beneath the blows of pokers and endirons. The villagers, thus aroused, came at last to our rescue, and at once proceeded to patch up a compromise. This, in view of the Amazonian reinforcements, who were standing by in readiness for a second onset, we were more than pleased to accept. From this inglorious combat, we came off without serious injury but with those gentle poker taps were knocked out forever all the sweet delusions of the light of the harem. The great antiquity of this Teheran Meshed road, which is undoubtedly a section of that former commercial highway between two of the most ancient capitals in history, Nineveh and Balkh, is very graphically shown by the caravan routes at Lasgird. These have been worn in many places to a depth of four feet in the solid rock. It was not far beyond this point that we began to feel the force of that famous Damgan wind, so called from the city of that name. Of course, this wind was against us. In fact, Throughout our Asiatic tour, easterly winds prevailed, and should we ever attempt another transcontinental spin, we would have a care to travel in the opposite direction. Our peculiar mode of travel subjected us to great extremes in our mode of living. Sometimes, indeed, it was a change almost from the sublime to the ridiculous, and vice versa. From a stable of sheepfold, with a diet of figs and bread, and an irrigating ditch for a lavatory, to a palace itself, an oriental palace, with all the delicacies of the East, and a host of servants to attend to our slightest wish. So it was at Bostam, the residence of one of Persia's most influential hakims, or governors, literally pillars of state, who was also a cousin to the Shah himself. This potentate we visited in company with an English engineer whom we met in transit at Sharud. It was on the evening before, when at supper with this gentleman in his tent, that a special messenger arrived from the governor, requesting us, as the invitation ran, to take our brightness into his presence. As we entered, the governor rose from his seat on the floor, a courtesy never shown us by a Turkish official. Even the politest of them would, just at this particular moment, be conveniently engrossed in the examination of some book or paper. His courtesy was further extended by locking up our horses and making us his prisoners until the following morning. At the dinner, which Mr. Evans and we were invited to eat with His Excellency, benches had to be especially prepared, as there was nothing like a chair to be found on the premises. The governor himself took his accustomed position on the floor, with his own private dishes around him. From these, he would occasionally fish out with his fingers some choice lamb kebab or cabbage dolma and have it passed over to his guests, an act which is considered one of the highest forms of Persian hospitality. With the shifting of the scenes of travel, we stood at sunset on the summit of the Binold Mountains, overlooking the valley of the Kashafrud, our two weeks' journey was almost ended, for the city of Meshed 
was now in view, ten miles away. Round us were piles of little stones, to which each pious pilgrim adds his quota when first he sees the holy shrine, which we beheld shining like a ball of fire in the glow of the setting sun. While we were building our pyramid, a party of returning pilgrims greeted us with Meshedi at last. Not yet, we answered, for we knew that the gates of the holy city closed promptly at twilight. Yet we determined to make the attempt. On we sped, but not with the speed of the falling night. Dusk overtook us as we reached the plain. A moving form was revealed to us on the bank of the irrigating canal, which skirted the edge of the road. Backward it fell as we dashed by, and then the sound of a splash and splutter reached us as we disappeared in the darkness. On the morrow we learned that the spirit of Hassan and Hussein were seen skimming the earth in their flight toward the holy city. We reached the bridge and crossed the moat, but the gates were closed. We knocked and found it, but a hollow echo was our only response. At last the light of a lantern illumined the crevices in the weather-beaten doors, and a weird-looking face appeared through the midway opening. Who is there? said a voice whose sepulchre tones might have belonged to the sexton of the holy tongue. We are Ferengis, we said, and must get into the city tonight. That is impossible, he answered, for the gates are locked, and the keys have been sent away to the governor's palace. With this, the night air grew more chill, but another thought struck us at once. We would send a note to General Maclean, the English consul general, who was already expecting us. This our interlocutor, for a certain Inam, or Turkish Bakshish, at length agreed to deliver. The general, as we afterward learned, sent a servant with a special request to the governor's palace. Here, without delay, a squad of horsemen was detailed and ordered with the keys to the Herat gate. The crowds in the streets, attracted by this unusual turnout at this unusual hour, followed in their wake to the scene of disturbance. There was a click of locks, the clanking of chains, and the creaking of rusty hinges. The great doors swung open and the crowd of expectant faces received us in the holy city. Meshed claims our attention chiefly for its famous dead. In its sacred dust lie buried our old hero, Harun al-Rashid, Firdusi, Persia's greatest epic poet, and the holy Imam Riza, within whose shrine every criminal may take refuge from even the Shah himself until the payment of a blood tax or a debtor until the giving of a guarantee for debt. No infidel can enter there. Meshed was the pivotal point upon which our wheel of fortune was to turn. We were filled with no little anxiety, therefore, when, on the day after our arrival, we received an invitation to call at the Russian Consulate General. With great ceremony, we were ushered into a suite of elegantly furnished rooms, and received by the Consul General and his English wife in full dress. Madame de Vlasso was radiant with smiles as she served us tea by the side of her steaming silver samovar. She could not wait for the circumlocution of diplomacy, but said, It is all right, gentlemen. General Kuropatkin has just telegraphed permission for you to proceed to Askabad. This precipitate remark evidently disconcerted the consul, 
who could only nod his head and say, We, oui, we, oui, in affirmation. This news lifted a heavy load from our minds. Our desert journey of six hundred miles, therefore, had not been made in vain, and the prospect brightened for a trip through the heart of Asia. Between the rival hospitality of the Russian and English consulates, our health was now in jeopardy from excess of kindness. Among other social attentions, we received an invitation from Sahib Divan, the governor of Kharasan, who next to the Shah is the richest man in Persia. Although seventy-six years of age, on the day of our visit to his palace he was literally covered with diamonds and precious stones. With the photographer to the Shah as German interpreter, we spent half an hour in an interesting conversation. Among other topics, he mentioned the receipt, a few days before, of a peculiar telegram from the Shah, cut off the head of any one who attempts opposition to the tobacco regime. And this was followed a few days after by the inquiry, how many heads have you taken? A retinue of about 300 courtiers followed the governor as he walked out with feeble steps to the parade ground. Here a company of Persian cavalry was detailed to clear the field for the wonderful steel horses, which, as was said, had come from the capital in two days, a distance of 600 miles. The governor's extreme pleasure was afterward expressed in a special letter for our journey to the frontier. The military road, now completed between Askabad and Mishhad, reveals the extreme weakness of Persia's defense against Russian aggression. Elated by her recent successes in the matter of a Russian consul at Mishhad, Russia has very forcibly invited Persia to construct more than half of a road, which, in connection with the Transcaspian Railway, makes Kharasan almost an exclusive Russian market, and opens Persia's richest province to Russia's troops and cannon on the prospective march to Herat. At this very writing, if the telegraph speaks the truth, the Persian border province of Dergez is another session by what the Russians are pleased to call their Persian vassal. In addition to its increasing commercial traffic, this road is patronized by many Shia devotees from the north, among whom are what the natives term the silent pilgrims. These are large stones or boulders rolled along a few feet at a time by the passers-by toward the holy city. We ourselves were employed in this pious work at the close of our first day's journey from Mishhad, when we were suddenly aroused by a bantering voice behind us. Looking up, we were hailed by Stagno Navarro, the inspector of the Persian Telegraph, who was employed with this back, who was employed with his men on a neighboring line. With this gentleman, we spent the following night in a telegraph station and passed a pleasant evening chatting over the wires with friends in Meshhead. Kuchan, our next stopping place, lies on the almost imperceptible watershed which separates the Herat Valley from the Caspian Sea. This city, only a few months ago, was entirely destroyed by a severe earthquake. Under date of January 28, 1894, the American press reported, The bodies of 10,000 victims of the awful disaster have already been recovered. 50,000 cattle were destroyed at the same time. The once important and beautiful city of 20,000 people is now only a scene of death, desolation, and terror. 
From this point to Askabad, the construction of the military highway speaks well for Russia's engineering skill. It crosses the Kopet Dag mountains over seven distinct passes in a distance of 80 miles. This we determined to cover, if possible, in one day, inasmuch as there was no intermediate stopping place, and as we were not a little delighted by the idea of at last emerging from semi-barbarism into semi-civilization. At sunset, we were scaling the fifth ridge since leaving Kuchan at daybreak, and a few minutes later rolled up before the Persian custom house in the valley below. There was no evidence of the proximity of a Russian frontier, except the extraordinary size of the tea glasses from which we slaked our intolerable thirst. During the day we had had a surfeit of cavernous gorges and commanding pinnacles, but very little water. The only copious spring we were able to find was filled at the time with the unwashed linen of a Persian traveler, who sat by, smiling in derision, as we upbraided him for his disregard of the traveling public. It was already dusk when we came in sight of the Russian custom house, a tin-roofed stone structure contrasting strongly with the Persian mud hovels we had left behind. A Russian official hailed us as we shot by, but we could not stop on the downgrade, and besides, darkness was too rapidly approaching to brook any delay. Askabad was twenty-eight miles away, and although wearied by an extremely hard day's work, we must sleep that night, if possible, in a Russian hotel. Our pace increased with the growing darkness until at length we were going at the rate of 12 miles per hour down a narrow gorge-like valley toward the seventh and last ridge that lay between us and the desert. At 9.30 p.m. we stood upon its summit, and before us stretched the sandy wastes of Karakum, enshrouded in gloom. Thousands of feet below us the city of Askabad was ablaze with lights, shining like beacons on the shore of the desert sea. Strains of music from a Russian band stole faintly up through the darkness as we dismounted and contemplated the strange scene, until the shriek of a locomotive whistle startled us from our reveries. Across the desert, a train of the Transcaspian Railway was gliding smoothly along toward the city. A hearty welcome back to civilized life was given us the next evening by General Kuropatkin himself, the Governor General of Transcaspia. During the course of a dinner with him and his friends, he kindly assured us that no further recommendation was needed than the fact that we were American citizens to entitle us to travel from one end of the Russian Empire to the other. From Askabad to Samarkand, there was a break in the continuity of our bicycle journey. Our Russian friends persuaded us to take advantage of the Transcaspian Railway and not to hazard a journey across the dreaded Karakum sands. Such a journey, made upon the railroad track, where water and food were obtainable at regular intervals, would have entailed only a small part of the hardship incurred on the deserts in China. Yet we were more than anxious to reach, before the advent of winter, a point whence we could be assured of reaching the Pacific during the following season. Through the kindness of the railway authorities at Bokora Station, our car was sidetracked to enable us to visit, ten miles away, the ancient city of the east. On November 6, we reached Samarkand, the ancient capital of Tamerlane, and the present terminus of the Transcaspian Railway. End of section 6
Section seven of Across Asia on a Bicycle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Across Asia on a Bicycle by Thomas Allen. Chapter four The Journey from Samarkand to Kuldja. Part one on the morning of november the sixteenth we took a last look at the blue domes and minarets of samarkand intermingled with the ruins of palaces and tombs and then wheeled away toward the banks of zerafshan our four days journey of one hundred and eighty miles along the regular russian post road was attended with only the usual vicissitudes of ordinary travel wading in our russian top boots through the treacherous ford of the snake defile we passed the pyramidal slate rock known as the gate of tamerlane and emerged upon a strip of the kizilcoom steppe stretching hence in painful monotony to the bank of the serdaria river this we crossed by a rude rope ferry filled at the time with a passing caravan and then began at once to ascend the valley of the chechik towards tashkend the blackened cotton which the natives were gathering from the fields the lowering snow line on the mountains the muddy roads the chilling atmosphere and the falling leaves of the giant poplars all warned us of the approach of winter we had hoped at least to reach vernoy a provincial capital near the converging point of the turkestan siberian and chinese boundaries whence we could continue on the opening of the following spring either through siberia or across the chinese empire but in this we were doomed to disappointment the delay on the part of the russian authorities in granting us permission to enter transcaspia had postponed at least a month our arrival in tashkend and now owing to the early advent of the rainy season the roads leading north were almost impassable even for the native carts this fact together with the reports of heavy snowfalls beyond the alexandrovsky mountains on the road to vernoy lent a rather cogent influence to the persuasions of our friends to spend the winter among them then too such a plan we thought might not be unproductive of future advantages thus far we had been journeying through russian territory without a passport we had no authorization except the telegram to come on received from general kuropatkine at askabad and the verbal permission of count rostazov at samarkand to proceed to tashkend furthermore the passport for which we had just applied to baron revsky the governor-general of turkestan would be available only as far as the border of siberia where we should have to apply to the various governors-general along our course to the pacific in case we should find the route across the chinese empire impracticable a general permission to travel from tashkend to the pacific coast through southern siberia could be obtained from st petersburg only and that only through the chief executive of the province through which we were passing permission to enter turkestan is by no means easily obtained as is well understood by the student of russian policy in central asia we were not a little surprised therefore when our request to spend the winter in its capital was graciously granted by baron revsky as well as the privilege for one of us to return in the meantime to london this we had determined on in order to secure some much-needed bicycle supplies and to complete other arrangements for the success of our enterprise by lot the return trip fell to the Sackleben. proceeding by the transcaspian and transcaucasus railroads the caspian and black seas to constantinople and thence by the overland express to belgrade vienna frankfurt and calais he was able to reach london in sixteen days tashkend though nearly in the same latitude as new york is so protected by the alexandrovsky mountains from the siberian blizzards and the scorching winds of the karakum desert as to have an even more moderate climate a tributary of the Cherchik river forms the line of demarcation between the native and the european portions of the city although the population of the latter is by no means devoid of a native element both together cover an area as extensive as paris though the population is only one hundred and twenty thousand 
of which one hundred thousand are congregated in the native or sart quarter there is a floating element of kashgarians bokhariots persians and afghans and a resident majority of kirghiz tartars jews hindus gypsies and sarts the latter being a generic title for the urban as distinguished from the nomad people our winter quarters were obtained at the home of a typical russian family in company with a young reserve officer he having finished his university career and time of military service was engaged in tashkend in the interest of his father a wholesale merchant in moscow with him we were able to converse either in french or german both of which languages he could speak more purely than his native russian our good-natured corpulent host had emigrated in the pioneer days from the steppe of southern russia and had grown wealthy through the unearned increment the russian samovar is the characteristic feature of the russian household besides a big bowl of cabbage soup at every meal our russian host would start in with a half tumbler of vodka dispose of a bottle of beer in the intervals and then top off with two or three glasses of tea the mistress of the household being limited in her beverages to tea and soup would usually make up in quantity what was lacking in variety in fact one day she informed us that she had not imbibed a drop of water for over six years for this however there is a very plausible excuse with the water at tashkend as with that from the zerafshan at bokhara a dangerous worm called reshta is absorbed into the system nowhere have we drunk better tea than around the steaming samovar of our tashkend host no peasant is too poor either in money or in sentiment to buy and feel the cheering influence of tea even the cossack in his forays into the wilds of central asia is sustained by it unlike the chinese the russians consider sugar a necessary concomitant of tea drinking there are three methods of sweetening tea to put the sugar in the glass to place a lump of sugar in the mouth and suck the tea through it to hang a lump in the midst of a tea drinking circle to be swung around for each in turn to touch with his tongue and then to take a swallow of tea the meaning of the name tashkend is city of stone but a majority of the houses are one-story mud structures built low so as to prevent any disastrous effects from earthquakes the roofs are so flat and poorly constructed that during the rainy season a dry ceiling is rather the exception than the rule every building is covered with whitewash or white paint and fronts directly on the street there are plenty of back and side yards but none in the front this is not so bad on the broad streets of a russian town in tashkent they are exceptionally wide with ditches on each side through which the water from the churchik ripples along beneath the double and even quadruple rows of poplars acacias and willows these trees grow here with remarkable luxuriance from a mere twig stuck into the ground although twenty years of russian irrigation has given nature a chance to rear thousands of trees on former barren wastes yet wood is still comparatively scarce and dear the administration buildings of the city are for the most part exceedingly plain and unpretentious in striking contrast is the new russian cathedral the recently erected school and a large retail store built by a resident greek all of which are fine specimens of russian architecture among its institutions are an observatory a museum containing an embryo collection of turkestan products and antiquities and a medical dispensary for the natives where vaccination is performed by graduates of medicine in the Tashken school the rather extensive library was originally collected for the chancellery of the governor-general and contains the best collection of works on central asia that is to be found in the world including in its scope not only books and pamphlets but even magazines and newspaper articles for amusements the city has a theatre a small imitation of the opera house at paris and the military club which with its billiards and gambling and weekly reunions balls and concerts though a regular feature of a russian garrison town is especially pretentious in tashkend in size architecture and appointments the clubhouse has no equal we were told outside the capital and moscow 
tashkend has long been known as a refuge for damaged reputations and shattered fortunes or the official purgatory following upon the emperor's displeasure one of the finest houses of the city is occupied by the grand duke nikolai konstantinovich romanov son of the late general admiral of the russian navy and first cousin to the tsar who seems to be cheerfully resigned to his life in exile most of his time is occupied with the business of his silk factory on the outskirts of tashkend and at his farm near hojent which a certain firm in chicago at the time of our sojourn was stocking with irrigating machinery all of his bills are paid with checks drawn on his st petersburg trustees his private life is rather unconventional and even democratic visitors to his household are particularly impressed with the beauty of his wife and the size of his liquor glasses the example of the grand duke illustrates the sentiment in favor of industrial pursuits which is growing among the military classes and even among the nobility of russia the government itself thanks to the severe lesson of the crimean war has learned that a great nation must stand upon a foundation of something more than aristocracy and nobility to this influence is largely due the present growing prosperity of tashkend which in military importance is rapidly giving way to askabad the key to herat the spirit of equality and fraternity which characterizes the government of a russian mir or village has been carried even into central asia we have frequently seen russian peasants and natives occupying adjoining apartments in the same household while in the process of trade all classes seem to fraternize in an easy and even cordial manner the same is true of the children who play together indiscriminately in the street many a one of these heterogeneous groups we have watched playing marbles with the ankle bones of sheep and listened with some amusement to their half russian half native jargon schools are now being established to educate the native children in the russian language and methods and native apprentices are being taken in by russian merchants for the same purpose in tashkent as in every european city of the orient drunkenness and gambling and social laxity have followed upon the introduction of western morals and culture jealousy and intrigue among the officers and functionaries are also not strange perhaps at so great a distance from headquarters where the only avenue to distinction seems to lie through the public service at the various dinner parties and sociables given throughout the winter the topic of war always met with general welcome on one occasion a report was circulated that abdurrahman khan the amir of afghanistan was lying at the point of death great preparations it was said were being made for an expedition over the pamir to establish on the throne the russian candidate is shah khan from samarkand before ayub khan the rival british protege could be brought from india the young officers at once began to discuss their chances for promotion and the number of decorations to be forthcoming from st petersburg the social gatherings at tashkent were more convivial than sociable acquaintances can eat and drink together with the greatest of good cheer but there is very little sympathy in conversation it was difficult for them to understand why we had come so far to see a country which to many of them was a place of exile an early spring morning did not mean an early departure from winter quarters impassable roads kept us anxious prisoners for a month and a half after the necessary papers had been secured these included in addition to the local passports a carte blanche permission to travel from tashkent to vladivostok through turkestan and siberia a document obtained from st petersburg through the united states minister the hon charles emory smith of this route to the pacific we were therefore certain and yet despite the universal opinion that a bicycle journey across the celestial empire was impracticable we had determined to continue on to the borderline and there to seek better information don't go into china were the last words of our many kind friends as we wheeled out of tashkend on the seventh of may at chimkend our course turned abruptly from what was once the main route between russia's european and asiatic capitals and along which de lesseps in his letter to the tsar proposed a line of railroad to connect orenburg with samarkand a distance about equal to that between st petersburg and odessa 
1483 miles this is also the keystone in that wall of forts which russia gradually raised around her unruly nomads of the steppes and where according to gorchakoff's circular of 1864 both interest and reason required her to stop and yet at that very time general chernayev was advancing his forces upon the present capital tashkend here too we began that journey of fifteen hundred miles along the celestial mountain range which terminated only when we scaled its summit beyond barkul and descend again into the burning sands of the desert of gobi here runs the great historical highway between china and the west from ali eta eastward we had before us about two hundred miles of vast steppe region near the mountains is a wilderness of lakes swamps and streams which run dry in summer this is the country of the thousand springs mentioned by the chinese pilgrim huen sang and where was established the kingdom of black china supposed by many to have been one of the kingdoms of prester john but far away to our left were the white sands of the ak kum over which the cloudless atmosphere quivers incessantly like the blasts of a furnace of all these deserts occupying probably one half of the whole turkistan steppe none is more terrible than that of the golodnaya steppe or steppe of hunger to the north of the white sands now before us even in the cool of evening it is said that the soles of the wayfarer's feet become scorched and the dog accompanying him finds no repose till he has burrowed below the burning surface the monotonous appearance of the steppe itself is only intensified in winter when the snow smooths over the broken surface and even necessitates the placing of mud posts at regular intervals to mark the roadway for the kirghiz post drivers but in the spring and autumn its arid surface is clothed as if by enchantment with verdure and prairie flowers both flowers and birds are gorgeously colored one variety about half the size of the jackdaw which infests the houses of tashkend and samarkand has a bright blue body and red wings another resembling our field lark in size and habits combines a pink breast with black head and wings but already this springtide splendor was beginning to disappear beneath the glare of approaching summer the long wagon trains of lumber and the occasional traveller's tarantas rumbling along to the discord of its duga bells were enveloped in a cloud of suffocating dust now and then we would overtake a party of russian peasants migrating from the famine-stricken districts of european russia to the pioneer colonies along this turkestan highway the peculiarity of these villages is their extreme length all the houses facing on the one wide street most of them are merely mud huts others make pretensions to doors and windows and a coat of whitewash nearby usually stands the old battered telega which served as a home during many months of travel over the orenburg highway it speaks well for the colonizing capacity of the russians that they can be induced to come so many hundreds of miles from their native land to settle in such a primitive way among the half-wild tribes of the steppes as yet they do very little farming but live like the kirghiz by raising horses cows sheep and goats and in addition the russian hog the last resembling very much the wild swine of the jungles instead of the former military colonies of plundering cossack who really become more assimilated to the kirghiz than these to their conquerors the mir or communal system is now penetrating these fertile districts and systematically replacing the mongolian culture but the ignorance of this lower class of russians is almost as noticeable as that of the natives themselves as soon as we entered a village the blacksmith left his anvil the carpenter his bench the storekeeper his counter and the milkmaid her task after our parade of the principal street the crowd would gather round us at the station house all sorts of queries and ejaculations would pass among them one would ask are these gentlemen baptized are they really christians on account of their extreme ignorance these russian colonists are by no means able to cope with their german colleagues who are given the poorest land and yet make a better living the steppe is a good place for learning patience with the absence of landmarks you seem never to be getting anywhere it presents the appearance of a boundless level expanse the very undulations of which are so uniform as to conceal the intervening troughs 
into these horsemen and sometimes whole caravans mysteriously disappear in this way we were often enabled to surprise a herd of gazelles grazing by the roadside they would stand for a moment with necks extended and then scamper away like a shot springing on their pipe stem limbs three or four feet into the air our average rate was about seven miles an hour although the roads were sometimes so soft with dust or sand as to necessitate the laying of straw for a foundation there was scarcely an hour in the day when we were not accompanied by from one to twenty kirghiz horsemen galloping behind us with cries of yakshi good they were especially curious to see how we crossed the roadside streams standing on the bank they would watch intently every move as we stripped and waded through with bicycles and clothing on our shoulders then they would challenge us to a race and if the road permitted we would endeavor to reveal some of the possibilities of the devil's carts on an occasion like this occurred one of our few mishaps the road was lined by the occupants of a neighboring tent village who had run out to see the race one of the kirghiz turned suddenly back in the opposite direction from which he had started the wheel struck him at a rate of fifteen miles per hour lifting him off his feet and hurling over the handlebars the rider who fell upon his left arm and twisted it out of place with the assistance of the bystanders it was pulled back into the socket and bandaged up till we reached the nearest russian village here the only physician was an old blind woman of the faith cure persuasion her massage treatment to replace the muscles was really effective and was accompanied by prayers and by signs of the cross a common method of treatment among the lower class of russians in one instance a cure was supposed to be effected by writing a prayer on a piece of buttered bread to be eaten by the patient being users but not patrons of the russian post roads we were not legally entitled to the conveniences of the post stations tipping alone as we found on our journey from samarkand was not always sufficient to preclude a request during the night to vacate the best quarters for the post traveller especially if he happened to wear the regulation brass button to secure us against this inconvenience and to gain some special attention a letter was obtained from the overseer of the turkestan post and telegraph district this proved advantageous on many occasions and once at aluita was even necessary we were surveyed with suspicious glances as soon as we entered the station house and when we asked for water to lave our hands and face we were directed to the irrigating ditch in the street our request for a better room was answered by the question if the one we had was not good enough and how long we intended to occupy that evidently our english conversation had gained for us the covert reputation of being english spies and this was verified in the minds of our hosts when we began to ask questions about the city prisons we had passed on our way to every interrogation they replied i don't know but presto change on the presentation of documents apologies were now profuse and besides tea bread and eggs the usual rations of a russian post station we were exceptionally favoured with chicken soup and verandvik the latter consisting of cheese wrapped and boiled in dough and then served in butter it has been the custom for travellers in russia to decry the russian post station but the fact is that an appreciation of this rather primitive form of accommodation depends entirely upon whether you approach it from a european hotel or from a persian khan some are clean while others are dirty nevertheless it was always a welcome sight to see a small white building looming up in the dim horizon at the close of a long day's ride and on near approach to observe the black and white striped post in front and idle tarantasses around it at the door would be found the usual crowd of kirghiz post drivers after the presentation of documents to the starosta who would hesitate at first about quartering our horses in the traveller's room we would proceed at once to place our dust-covered heads beneath the spindle of the washing tank although by this dripping pan arrangement we would usually succeed in getting as much water down our backs as on our faces yet we were consoled by the thought that too much was better than not enough as had been the case in turkey and persia 
then we would settle down before the steaming samovar to meditate in solitude and quiet while the rays of the declining sun shone on the gilded icon in the corner of the room and on the chromo covered walls when darkness fell and the simmering music of the samovar had gradually died away when the flitting swallows in the room had ceased their chirp and settled down upon the rafters overhead we ourselves would turn in under our fur-lined coats upon the leather-covered benches End of section seven. Section eight of Across Asia on a Bicycle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Across Asia on a Bicycle by Thomas Allen. Chapter four, part two in consequence of the first of a series of accidents to our wheels we were for several days the guests of the director of the botanical gardens at pishpek as a branch of the crown botanical gardens at st petersburg some valuable experiments were being made here with foreign seeds and plants peaches we were told do not thrive but apples pears cherries and the various kinds of berries grow as well as they do at home rye however takes three years to reach the height of one year in america through the russians these people have obtained high-flown ideas of america and americans we saw many chromos of american celebrities in the various station houses and the most numerous was that of thomas a edison his phonograph we were told had already made its appearance in pishpek but the natives did not seem to realize what it was why they said we have often heard better music than that dr tanner was not without his share of fame in this far-away country during his fast in america a similar though not voluntary feat was being performed here a kogis messenger who had been dispatched into the mountains during the winter was lost in the snow and remained for twenty-eight days without food he was found at last crazed by hunger when asked what he would have to eat he replied everything they foolishly gave him everything and in two days he was dead for a long time he was called the dr tanner of turkestan a divergence of seventy-five miles from the regular post route was made in order to visit lake isik kool which is probably the largest lake for its elevation in the world being about ten times larger than lake geneva and at a height of fifty three hundred feet its slightly brackish water which never freezes teems with several varieties of fish many of which we helped to unhook from a russian fisherman's line and then helped to eat in his primitive hut near the shore a russian cossack who had just come over the snow-capped alatau of the shade from fort narin was also present and from the frequent glances cast at the fisherman's daughter we soon discovered the object of his visit the ascent to this lake through the famous buam defile or happy pass afforded some of the grandest scenery on our route through asia its seething foaming irresistible torrent needs only a large volume to make it the equal of the rapids at niagara our return to the post road was made by an unbeaten track over the alatau mountains from the chu valley dotted here and there with kirghiz tents and their grazing flocks and herds we pushed our wheels up the broken path which wound like a mythical stairway far up into the low-hanging clouds we trudged up one of the steepest ascents we have ever made with a wheel the scenery was grand but lonely the wild tulips pinks and verbenas dotting the green slopes furnished the only pleasant diversion from our arduous labor just as we turned the highest summit the clouds shifted for a moment and revealed before us two kirghiz horsemen they started back in astonishment and gazed at us as though we were demons of the air until we disappeared again down the opposite and more gradual slope late in the afternoon we emerged upon the plain but no post road or station house was in sight as we expected nothing but a few kirghiz kibitkas among the straggling rocks like the tents of the egyptian arabs among the fallen stones of the pyramids 
toward these we now directed our course and in view of a rapidly approaching storm asked to purchase a night's lodging this was only too willingly granted in anticipation of the coming tomasha or exhibition the milkmaids as they went out to the rows of sheep and goats tied to the lines of woolen rope and the horsemen with reinless horses to drive in the ranging herds spread the news from tent to tent by the time darkness fell the kibitka was filled to overflowing we were given the seat of honor opposite the doorway bolstered up with blankets and pillows by the light of the fire curling its smoke upward through the central opening in the roof it was interesting to note the faces of our hosts we had never met a people of a more peaceful temperament and on the other hand none more easily frightened a dread of the evil eye is one of their characteristics we had not been settled long before the ishan or itinerant dervish was called in to drive away the evil spirits which the devil's carts might possibly have brought immediately on entering he began to shrug his shoulders and to shiver as though passing into a state of trance our dervish acquaintance was a man of more than average intelligence he had travelled in india and had even heard someone speak of america this fact alone was sufficient to warrant him in posing as instructor for the rest of the assembly while we were drinking tea a habit they have recently adopted from the russians he held forth at great length to his audience about the american the rain now began to descend in torrents the felt covering was drawn over the central opening and propped up at one end with a pole to emit the clouds of smoke from the smouldering fire this was shifted with the veering wind although a mere circular rib framework covered the white or brown felt according as the occupant is rich or poor the kirghiz kibitka or more properly yurt is not as a house builded upon the sand even in the fiercest storm its staunchness and comfort are surprising when we consider the rapidity with which it may be taken down and transported in half an hour a whole village may vanish emigrating northward in summer and southward in winter many a kirghiz cavalcade was overtaken on the road with long tent ribs and felts tied upon the backs of two humped camels for the bactrian dromedary has not been able to endure the severities of these northern climates the men would always be mounted on the camels or horses backs while the women would be perched on the oxen and bullocks trained for the saddle and as beasts of burden the men never walk if there is any leading to be done it falls to the women the constant use of the saddle has made many of the men bandy-legged which in connection with their usual obesity with them a mark of dignity gives them a comical appearance after their curiosity regarding us had been partly satisfied it was suggested that a sheep should be slaughtered in our honour neither meat nor bread is ever eaten by any but the rich kirghiz their universal kumis corresponding to the turkish yaut or coagulated milk and other forms of lacteal dishes sometimes mixed with meal form the chief diet of the poor the wife of our host a buxom woman who as we had seen could leap upon a horse's back as readily as a man now entered the doorway carrying a full-grown sheep by its woolly coat this she twirled over on its back and held down with her knee while the butcher artist drew a dagger from his belt and held it aloft until the assembly stroked their scant beards and uttered the solemn bismillah tired out by the day's ride we fell asleep before the arrangements for the feast had been completed when awakened near midnight we found that the savoury odour from the huge cauldron on the fire had only increased the attraction and the crowd the choicest bits were now selected for the guests these consisted of pieces of liver served with lumps of fat from the tail of their peculiarly fat-tailed sheep as an act of the highest hospitality our host dipped these into some liquid grease and then reaching over placed them in our mouths with his fingers it required considerable effort on this occasion to subject our feelings of nausea to a sense of kirghiz politeness in keeping with their characteristic generosity every one in the kibitka must partake in some measure of the feast although the women who had done all the work must be content with remnants and bones already picked over by the host 
but this disposition to share everything was not without its other aspect we also were expected to share everything with them we were asked to bestow any little trinket or knick-knack exposed to view an extra nut on the machine a handkerchief a packet of tea or a lump of sugar excited their cupidity at once the latter was considered a bonbon by the women and younger portion of the spectators the attractive daughter of our host kumis john amused herself by stealing lumps of sugar from our pockets when the feast was ended the beards were again stroked the name of alas solemnly uttered by way of thanks for the bounty of heaven and then each gave utterance to his appreciation of the meal before retiring for the night the dervish led the prayers just as he had done at sunset the praying mats were spread and all heads bowed toward mecca the only preparation for retiring was the spreading of blankets from the pile in one of the kibitkas the kirghiz are not in the habit of removing many garments for this purpose and under the circumstances we found this custom a rather convenient one six of us turned in on the floor together forming a semicircle with our feet toward the fire kumis john who was evidently the pet of the household had a rudely constructed cot at the far end of the kibitka bernoy the old almati with its broad streets low wooden brick houses and russian signboards presented a siberian aspect the ruins of its many disastrous earthquakes lying low on every hand told us at once the cause of its deserted thoroughfares the terrible shocks of the year before our visit killed several hundred people and a whole mountain in the vicinity sank the only hope of its persistent residence is a branch from the trans-siberian or trans-caspian railroad or the reannexation by russia of the fertile province of Ili, to make it an indispensable depot despite these periodical calamities vernoy has had and is now constructing under the genius of the french architect paul l gourdet some of the finest edifices to be found in central asia the orphan asylum a magnificent three-story structure is now being built on experimental lines to test its strength against earthquake shocks one of the chief incidents of our pleasant sojourn was afforded by governor ivanov we were invited to head the procession of the cossacks on their annual departure for their summer encampment in the mountains after the usual religious ceremony they filed out from the city parade ground being unavoidably detained for a few moments we did not come up until some time after the column had started as we dashed by to the front with the american and russian flags fluttering side by side from the handlebars cheer after cheer arose from the ranks and even the governor and his party doffed their caps in acknowledgment at the camp we were favored with a special exhibition of horsemanship by a single twist of the rein the steeds would fall to the ground and their riders crouch down behind them as a bulwark in battle then dashing forward at full speed they would spring to the ground and leap back again into the saddle or hanging by their legs would reach over and pick up a handkerchief cap or a soldier supposed to be wounded all these movements we photographed with our camera of the endurance of these cossacks and the kirghiz horses we had a practical test overtaking a cossack courier in the early part of a day's journey he became so interested in the velocipede as the russians called the bicycle that he determined to see as much of it as possible he stayed with us the whole day over a distance of fifty-five miles his chief compensation was in witnessing the surprise of the natives to whom he would shout across the fields to come and see the tomasha adding in explanation that we were the american gentlemen who had ridden all the way from america our speed was not slow and frequently the poor fellow would have to resort to the whip or shout slowly gentlemen my horse is tired the town is not far away it is not necessary to hurry so the fact is that in all our experience we found no horse of even the famed kirghiz or, or turkoman breed that could travel with the same ease and rapidity as ourselves even over the most ordinary road at vernoy we began to glean practical information about china but all except our genial host m gourdet counselled us against our proposed journey he alone as a traveller of experience 
advised a divergence from the Siberian route at Altin Imel in order to visit the Chinese city of Kuldja, where, as he said, with the assistance of the resident Russian consul, we could test the validity of the Chinese passport received, as before mentioned, from the Chinese minister at London. A few days later we were rolling up the valley of the Ely, having crossed that river by the well-constructed Russian bridge at Fort Ilisk, the head of navigation for the boats from Lake Balkash. New faces here met our curious gaze. As an ethnological transition between the inhabitants of Central Asia and the Chinese, we were now among two distinctly agricultural races, the Dungans and the Taranchis. As the invited guests of these people on several occasions, we were struck with their extreme cleanliness, economy, and industry, but their deep-set eyes seemed to express reckless cruelty. The Mohammedan mosques of this people are like the Chinese pagodas in outward appearance, while they seem to be Chinese in half Kyrgyz garments. Their women, too, do not veil themselves, although they are much more shy than their rugged sisters of the steppes. Tenacious of their word, these people were also scrupulous about returning favours. Our exhibitions were usually rewarded by a spread of sweets and yellow dungan tea. Of this we would partake beneath the shade of their well-trained grape arbours, while listening to the music, or rather discord, of a peculiar stringed instrument played by the boys. Its bow of two parts was so interlaced with the strings of the instrument as to play upon two at every draw. Another musician usually accompanied by beating little sticks on a saucer. These are the people who were introduced by the Manchus to replace the Kalmuks in the Kuldja district, and who in 1869 so terribly avenged upon their masters the blood they previously caused to flow. The fertile province of Kuldja with a population of two and a half million, was reduced by their massacres to one vast necropolis. On all sides are canals that have become swamps, abandoned fields, wasted forests, and towns and villages in ruins, in some of which the ground is still strewn with the bleached bones of the murdered. As we ascended the Ili Valley, piles of stones marked in succession the sites of the towns of Turgen, Jarkent, Aken, and Kurgos, names which the russians are already reviving in their pioneer settlements the largest of these jarkent is the coming frontier town to take the place of evacuated kuldja about twenty-two miles east of this point the large white russian fort of Kurgos stands bristling on the bank of the river of that name which by the treaty of eighteen eighty one is now the boundary line of the celestial empire on a ledge of rocks overlooking the ford, a Russian sentinel was walking his beat in the solitude of a dreary outpost. He stopped to watch us as we plunged into the flood, with our Russian telega for a ferry-boat. "'All's well,' we heard him cry, as, bumping over the rocky bottom, we passed from Russia into China. "'Ah, yes,' we thought, "'all's well that ends well. But this is only the beginning.' A few minutes later we dashed through the arched driveway of the Chinese Custom House and were several yards away before the lounging officials realized what it was that flitted across their vision. Stop! Come back! they shouted in broken Russian. Amid a confusion of chattering voices, rustling gowns, clattering shoes, swinging pigtails, and clouds of opium and tobacco smoke, we were brought into the presence of the head official. Putting on his huge spectacles, he read aloud the visé written upon our American passports by the Chinese minister in London. His wonderment was increased when he further read that such a journey was being made on the foot-moved carriages, which were being curiously fingered by the attendants. Our garments were minutely scrutinized, especially the buttons, while our caps and dark-colored spectacles were taken from our heads and passed round for each to try on in turn amid much laughter owing to the predominant influence of russia in these northwestern confines our russian papers would have been quite sufficient to cross the border into kuldja it was only beyond this point that our chinese passport would be found necessary and possibly invalid after the usual visés had been stamped and written over we were off on what proved to be our six months experience in the middle kingdom or central empire as the natives call it for to Chinamen there is a fifth point of the compass, the centre, 
which is china not far on the road we heard the clatter of hoofs behind us a kalmuk was dashing toward us with a portentous look on his features we dismounted in apprehension he stopped short some twenty feet away leaped to the ground and crawling up on hands and knees began to chin chin or knock his head on the ground before us this he continued for some moments and then without a word gazed at us in wild astonishment our perplexity over this performance was increased when at a neighboring village a bewildered chinaman sprang out from the speechless crowd and threw himself in the road before us by a dexterous turn we missed his head and passed over his extended queue kulja with its russian consul and cossack station still maintains a russian telegraph and postal service the mail is carried from the border in a train of three or four tiligas which rattle along the primitive roads in a cloud of dust with armed cossacks galloping before and after and a russian flag carried by the herald in front even in the kulja post office a heavily armed picket stands guard over the money chest this postal caravan we now overtook encamped by a small stream during the glaring heat of the afternoon we found that we had been expected several days before and that quarters had been prepared for us in the postal station at the town of Suidun. here we spent the night and continued on to kulja the following morning although built by the chinese who call it nin yuan kulja with its houses of beaten earth strongly resembles the towns of russian turkestan since the evacuation by the russians the chinese have built around the city the usual quadrangular wall thirty feet in height and twenty feet in width with parapets still in the course of construction but the rows of poplars the whitewash and the telegas were still left to remind us of the temporary russian occupation for several days we were objects of excited interest to the mixed population the doors and windows of our russian quarters were besieged by crowds in defence of our host we gave a public exhibition and with the consent of the tute made the circuit on the top of the city walls fully three thousand people lined the streets and housetops to witness the race to which we had been challenged by four dungan horsemen riding below on the encircling roadway the distance around was two miles the horsemen started with a rush and at the end of the first mile were ahead at the third turning we overtook them and came to the finish two hundred yards ahead amid great excitement even the commander of the kulja forces was brushed aside by the chasing rabble end of section eight